Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and welcome back to the second channel geography video. And get this, this video is actually about geography, unlike most of my videos, which are 95% tangents and weird country facts. This is actually about the geographic world, because do you know what a forest is? I should certainly hope so, since you exist in the real world and you presumably speak English. Um, and so did you know the world's biggest forest is right here? That sounds fake, but did you know that London is actually the world's largest urban forest? That's right. London London is a forest, no literally, more than a fifth of the capital is trees, we dig into what that means and looking further into this article you can see that like, oh yeah, it all hinges on this one basic point that there is a United Nation definition that states that a forest is anywhere that's at least 20% trees. London is a respectable 21%. Ergo, more than 20. Ergo, uh, so London is the world's largest urban forest. Because it's obviously not the world, you know, London is a forest, but it's obviously not the world's largest forest. But it's the world's largest forest that has significant numbers of people living there. And boom, this is uh, readily backed up by if you go onto Google Maps and you go to satellite view, you can see that like, oh yeah, even when you go pretty far into London, there's a lot more green space. There's a lot more tree cover. If we go onto a random street in London, we're going to find a tree. Probably. Ah, there we go. Look how many trees there are. London is a forest. This is a really fun fact, and I, I really enjoy it just on the base level. Because if you compare it to other cities, it does seem true. Paris is similarly dense to London, but it's just... Again, very, very, very urban. Not as much green space in the inner city. Um, and the same is even true for New York, which famously has an, a huge park on there. If you ignore Central Park, and even if you don't ignore Central Park, it's a very not green landscape because it's very dense and concrete and building and they focus on people. Whereas there's a lot more green space in London. And so did you know it's the world's largest forest? Except, you know what? Honestly, I, I couldn't get over this because I did... Uh, this is a fun fact I've heard a couple of times and I really enjoy it and I want it to be true. But I, I learned this from Time Out. And Time Out is a wonderfully reputable source if you want to learn about things to do in your city. I mean, if you want to learn about uh, East End Chippies or about the 16 years of the World Naked Bike Ride, I think Time Out is a great website for doing so. However, I don't necessarily think they're the source of what isn't isn't a forest. And when they just say a United Nations definition, I'm not sure I get down with that. So I looked into it. I've done a lot of research into what an urban forest is. And according to the Gov UK website, it's like, oh yeah, it's, a, it's uh, you know, they're trees and forests around urban areas. But that's the government being shells. We can't trust them. So I went to Wikipedia and they say, yeah, it's a collection of trees grown within the city or town um, and so it's like it's it's the, it's the vegetation that grows around the settlement. The settlement itself is not the urban forest, instead the things around it are and indeed Wikipedia itself even says that Tiju Tijuca forest, Tiwaka forest is considered to be the largest urban forest even then giving you some sources and confirming uh, where that's from, Com contested understandings of the world's largest urban forest. And it gets very complex very quickly, but I was like, you know what, can we trust any of this? Let's just go to the UN themselves, let's find that very definition, and let's settle this. And so while looking for this, the only thing I'd find is this report from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Did you know the UN has a Food and Agriculture Organization? Like. I guess it makes sense that, you know, it's just a very weird organization given the UN's current role globally. I guess they want a bigger one. So long story short, they write very, very big uh, articles about urban forest. Like this is a very long report about everything's do of urban forests. There's so much they've written about urban forests, but they never define it once in this entire thing. They write so much about what's happening, but they don't, <laughs> the changing governance of them, but they don't define what, it, what an urban forest is. In fact, the closest thing I could find that did try to define it was this right here, an, an article published in 2019, interestingly, just after this book uh, in May of 2019, called London is a Forest, amusingly named that by someone called Paul Wood. And uh, what's really interesting is this same article, you'll notice was written on 11, uh, the 11th of November, 2019, not so long after this. So in reality, a guy published a book and he's pretty good at promoting it, it seems. You know, he's like, ooh, we're talking about uh, forests and their definitions and blah, blah, blah. He's got multiple blog posts and clearly uh, he's, he's got a good social media presence for this uh, book that he's written. However, uh, it then seems as though if you look into this more, this London is a Forest by Paul Wood book, you can actually find out that this Time Out article is not written by like a, a guy from this, it's not written by like a journalist, it's written by the guy who wrote the book claiming that London is a forest. And so this is kind of like hyperbole and stretch that seems like real fact. And so yeah, long story short, a guy wrote a book calling London a forest, then he wrote a bigger article, and then a lot of other articles ran with this article as their source. 
Um, but is it actually the world's largest urban forest? In the sense that words can mean whatever you want, I guess. But long story short, this video is going to be about London. And I wanted to talk about it a little bit, because now, unlike last time, I live here. And uh, I just wanted to share a few things that I find interesting. Is that all good? Actually, before that, this video is sponsored by... I'd like to quickly uh, ask it, because one of the cool things about this channel is every now and then you can find these weird niche overlaps. So if you happen to be in the weird overlap between people who like maps and are finding your way here, and... Uh, you like climbing? If you've been, if if you, if you climb actively in London, I'd love to because I I, I want to get back into it. But and I've tried a few different places around. But I want to I want to like I want to hear your thoughts about the best place or a good place to climb in London. If you actively climb, send me an email at ibx2cat at gmail.com. I'm pointing up there, but I'm not editing this video, so just link in the description or you know you you know the channel name ibx2catgmail.com. Send me an email if you've done any climbing in London and have any advice or words or anything like that. And I'd appreciate it because uh, yeah, there's a lot of things I I'm just that there's so many I don't know how to even begin trying them all out, which I guess I've been doing uh, recently. And you know how I get to the various climbing places, even ones as far away as Harrow. I I think there's one in Harrow. I could be mixing it up with something else, but I'm pretty sure there's a. Uh, there's an arch climbing center in Harrow. Could be mistaking it with another place entirely. But how would I get to climbing all the way on the other side of the city when famously I don't drive? And I'd love to use this as an opportunity to talk about one of the weird things about how I view public transport that makes me very different to a lot of other people on the internet where it's like public transport is only about getting disabled people or people who are on lower incomes from one place to another. And it's great for... Um, in my opinion, economic mobility. It's great for actual mobility for people who are lacking in it. But one of the interesting things about London that a lot of uh, people don't realize who maybe make these videos is that London is a city that kind of defies that traditional logic. And allow me to show you the London transit map. This is what the tube map looks like if you put it on a real map and you kind of uh, apply it. And you so this is every TFL service. It's not just the underground, you know, metro style services, which are most of the colors. It's also these orange lines, which are Overgrounds. So uh, it's also this, which is the uh, TFL rail, cross rail. It's like a new thing they're doing. It's also these, like, again, these are actual trains. That Sorry, these are actual trains, uh, the overground. They're just run by uh, London's transport body. Anyway, so this is the uh, map of all the services they provide. Anywhere on this network to anywhere else on this network, you pay a roughly fixed fare depending on where... Uh, how many zones you're going through. So somewhat equatable to distance traveled. I want to get back to that later because I've got a really fun example of how that's not true. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to just quickly say that this is the map of London Transport. And you'll notice something very interesting about London Transport. It's very much, um, again, if you if you look right here, this is the center of London and the center is very well covered. But then if you look outside of that, the north, very, very well covered. It's got these two overground branches. I mean, they're not really trained. Uh, they're not really uh, like proper commuter services, but they, they still are, so whatever, it's fine. Uh, then they've got this and this and this and this and this and all the way out there over this. Uh, but you'll notice the west, the north, and the northwest are incredibly well served by this. Uh, however, as you start going more northeast, you have the one central line and that's it. If you go east, you've got the new crossrail, which still isn't fully... Uh, running, it just goes to Liverpool Street, and you've got the district line at Upminster. That is the entirety of what this service has right here. If you go southeast, there is nothing. If you go uh, south fully, there is basically nothing. If you go southwest, there's still very little. Um, you know, there's a few lines going out to Wimbledon and stuff. But long story short, the tube focuses in a few directions. And allow me to um, show you something interesting, because you might assume all the public transports on the west and north, so that's where all the uh, the poor areas are, and the rich people drive in from Dartford, or Bromley, or Sidcup, or Welling. That's not even a real... Welling's the real name of a place in London. Blackfen, Blendon. These names are all fake, but they're real places that just aren't on the TfL public transport map. There's a little asterisk on that we'll come back to later. But interestingly, if we look right here at this London property price map, um, you might... these these areas in the southeast are actually some of the cheapest areas. Bexley is the, this is by borough, by the way, there's 32 London boroughs. Um, we'll, we'll ignore that for now. Bexley is one of the cheapest ones. And uh, then there's Bromley over here, also one of the cheaper ones. Whereas the most expensive ones, Barnet, which uh, just to quickly remind, uh, for, for those viewers not aware, this is Barnet, which has two end of tube lines. There's Cockfosters over here. Yes, there's Cockfosters. And then there's Barnet, which is, you know, it's it's a lot easier to work out how that station got its name. But also there's a ton of stations going down and they, they zig Exact their way through pretty effectively. Uh, and then in between them, you've also got a train line which goes through to the center of London. Basically, this borough is incredibly well served by trains. So is uh, on the, uh, you know, the, the western edges right here, Ealing in particular. And then especially the west of 
Central is incredibly well served. In fact, the most expensive uh, borough of London is Kensington and Chelsea. There's four There's four boroughs that are in this red tier of like, they're so expensive, don't even imagine trying to buy a place. 793 grand, 977 grand, 747 grand, and 1.2 million, the median sales price. There are 50% of properties sell for more than 1.2 million in Kensington and Chelsea. And so we just take Chelsea, right? This is Chelsea right over here. Have you heard of Chelsea? You might have heard of it. They've got a football team or something, but also they're incredibly uh, rich. Uh, and so if we go to Chelsea and we say, you know what, let's uh, let, let's try and find ourselves a, uh, a two bedroom uh, flat. And uh, you know, let's, let's set the budget nice and reasonably at 5 million. And it's like, okay, if I want to be near public transport, which is a bad thing, right? It's like, yeah, I want this 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 free bedroom flat near South Kensington is 2.2 million. <laughs> Jesus, that, this is it, it. Looks like someone died in here. If I'm being honest with you, they've got some very old tastes, and it's in like a proper court block. I really don't think I would enjoy living here, but yet someone does, and they paid 2.2 million, or they expect 2.2 million. I guess they probably bought it for a lot less. No, they bought it for 2.3 million in 2012. Jesus Christ. I just, anyway, long story short, there's very expensive places here. This is one of the most expensive bits of London. To even try and find the cheapest area you can, uh, the cheapest flats you can, it's always like, okay, if you really slum it, you can get a place for 720 grand. Um, sure, it's only, uh, you know, 72 square meters. That's not bad, actually, for a two bedroom flat. It's a, it's a nice enough flat, actually. Uh, and I guess the catch is, there's only 27 years left on the lease. So in 27 years, you no longer own this thing you paid about a million dollars for. So we'll ignore that for now, and we'll say this one. I, oh, less than six years left on this. Basically, if you spend less than a, a million, you're not gonna get a place with any any time left on the lease. So if you go up to 1.25, maybe at that price range, we can start getting places that we can keep forever. Oh, look at this. There we go, we can actually, uh, this, this place probably is yours for 100 years, if not for life. Wow, look at that. That is a normal looking flat and it's 1.2 million because it's in Chelsea. And here's the interesting thing, uh, this most expensive borough of London, Kensington, Chelsea, is incredibly well served by public transport. Again, there's Sloan Square, there is South Kensington, there's Gloucester Road, definitely pronounced Gloucester. People say Gloucester, but I mean, I see the U in this, anyway, uh, uh, I'll, I'll stop trolling people now. Uh, so they're served by not only the District Line, the Circle Line, the Piccadilly Line, but also they're served by the West London Line, I think this would be, the Overground, but also they're served by National Rail, all within this like wonderful little walking distance off their very own borough and city. And this is the most expensive bit of London. It's well served by the Tube. That's very interesting, right? The, uh, the, 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 the public transport in London is not meant to be for specific groups of people, it's meant to be for everyone. I've made this comment about how I've seen like business people on the tube before. I, I see them every day, every train, somewhere on that train, there are business people in suits going to and from work because it's the fastest way. If you want to get from Canary Wharf to your 1.2 million kind of okay flat in Chelsea, you're probably taking the Piccadilly line up to, I don't know, Green Park than the the Jubilee from there. Long story short, let's see if that's correct actually. You know, if you, if you wanted to do that, uh, let, let's let's see if I, I nailed that one, shall we? So if, if um, okay, you, you're, you work in Canary Wharf, you've got some high finance, you could bike in 46 minutes, you could attach the car, it'd be 37 minutes, or you could take the tube. Oh no, you take it to the district circle. Oh yeah, okay, you know, that's, that's just as fast, I guess. The, you, 31 minutes and you could be there, as opposed to four, 37 minutes in a car, ignoring parking, I guess you get a taxi, but the taxi would be slower and more expensive, so everyone gets the tube. That, and you can do that partially by making cars unfriendly, but that's not ideal governance, right? Like, force people not to do things. And you can also do that by making public transport very, very useful. Almost any two points in the central areas of London will be much faster by public transport than by other means. Um, I went to a bathroom appointment on the other side of London. I don't know if I should say too much actually, but long story short, took the tube there, was the fastest way. I had a, I had a, the, the usual example of like someone who can't, um, you know, use public transport. It's like, well, builders and stuff. My builder today came around on a bike. <laughs> I think he has a van for like when he starts working, but like, yeah, uh, he, uh, he, he, he catches the tube or he bikes to places and only uses his van when necessary. And that's an interesting uh, vibe for a city that is in, by the way, it's a, it's not like it's a, a, a not well off city. I mean, it, would people be able to afford these 1.2 million pound, very, very average looking flats if that was true? 
Actually, this is kind of a nice building. I mean, I, I, I feel like this should be houses and it's been turned into lots of flats and somehow those lots of flats are worth 1.2 million. I don't, I don't fully understand that. But what I do fully understand is that, um, yeah, it's a very interesting difference between London and other cities. And I just wanted to, before we go, because this is a London video, are there more facts to share? Yes, there is. Um, this is one of my favorite maps showing all the things on there. You know, there's lots of interesting uh, levels of like talking about the underground and the overground and London transport and like, did you know, subsurface lines are entirely different trains to the to the ones that go in the tunnels because the one in the tunnels have to go in tunnels. So every extra inch they add is kind of wasted space. Whereas these were just trains that happened to go underground. In interesting difference. You know, let's not talk about trains today too much though. Let's instead talk about train prices because here's the interesting thing about being on this because again, the being connected to the underground is a being connected to public transport is a viable improvement to your house price as according to this map. Um, because as you can see, like the worst connected boroughs to the underground, like Greenwich, even though Greenwich is really, really nice, uh, it's not connected very well. Or a better example, let's say, is like, um, Lewisham. Lewisham is right there in the center. It's like, if this is the city of London, the center, Lewisham's right there. It's still cheap. Is it cheap because, you know, something, something murder? Or is it cheap because they only have one branch of the DLR and then you gotta like, you gotta wind all the way up here, it through Canary Wharf, through the Tower of London, and then change to the tube. It's got a poor connection uh, to the uh, to the tube, and that's the only stop. Otherwise, you've got to take trains places, and trains are actually fine, and that's the reason there isn't much tube in South and East London, but that's a whole separate point. Let's talk about this network. This is the TFL network, which means London themselves set the fares for this, and it's all based on zones, but I want to tell you about my favorite anomaly about that, because this right here is one of the shortest distance between two stops on any train anywhere in the world. Um, Covent Garden to Leicester Square, it's about 319 meters. However, because both stations are in the central zone, the most expensive one, if we go to uh, TFL, you can find out that it's actually two pounds 40 uh, at any time if you'd like to do that. If you are lucky enough to have a rail card, as you probably should have if you're traveling in the UK, um, then as you can see, it's one pound 60 off peak, two pounds 40 peak, and it's five pound 50 in cash. Jesus, that's expensive. I wonder, every year someone must pay £5.50 to go between these two stations. And side note, it is worth mentioning, uh, every, any sane human would walk between these two, but it is technically the fastest route if you're already at one station going to the other. It takes less than a minute, it's rounded up on Google Maps, um, whereas if you were to drive that, it would take four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> because again, it's not, I mean, it's not a fun route. Also, it's congested central London and walking it would take four minutes. I guess you could bike in one minute as well. Anyway, long story short here is this is actually the uh, the fastest way between those two points, but not really because Covent Garden only has lifts. It's really hard to get down. Leicester Square will take you a while to get out of. It's not the fastest way between these two points, but um, damn it, I'm getting a phone call. Ah, it's not important. Thought it would, <laughs> now you can hear it. Anyway, so um, it's very interesting uh, to me, at least, because as you can see, um, you know, like uh, that, that's that's a very short distance that costs five pounds cash, one pound sixty if you use all the discounts for your availability to go three hundred meters. However, as you might have accidentally saw when I clicked, Heathrow Terminal Five to Upminster, which is roughly the the longest like point to point you can do, Zone Six to Zone Six. This is Heathrow Terminal Five over here, and uh, Upminster is all the way uh, on the other side of London. Have you heard of Upminster? You probably haven't. I went there once to change to a train to go to Taco Bell. So it's a 12 hour walk, 35.5 miles. It's a hour, actually I think that's an example where you should probably car rather than take two tube lines. Um, or you can get there around hour 33, or if you were really, again, that, and this would cost you, um, according to this right here, uh, it would cost you five pounds 30 peak, two pounds 20 off peak to do that normal journey. However, which is actually, I just realized that's the same price, or is it? No, it's, it's slightly more expensive. It's 60p more expensive to go 35 miles versus 300 meters. I can't do this. Let's just say 50 kilometers. You can go like a, a hundred times further for, for 60p more. But even crazier than that is if you take a diversion via, um, okay, we're gonna add an extra stop. How, how do we do this? What, am I, am I crazy? Am I missing the extra stop button? Um, so uh, yeah, the crazy thing here is that you can, okay, wait, directions, and then we just, we add in another one. Nope. I <laughs> can you not do on the on the web app maybe. Anyway, so long story short, uh, if you are to go not via Zone One, not via the centre of London, as this handy map will point out here, if you just go via Turnham Green, Gunnersbury, and Stratford, which is 
turn as green as somewhere over here somewhere, I want to say. And then you go via uh, the, the overground all the way around London, rather than going through the center. You can actually pay £1.15 for that same journey. This is with a rail card. If you don't have a rail card, because, you know, you're, you're missing out, it's £1.70. Who can, who can you know, do that? That's crazy high. But yeah, £1.70 for a journey of about 50 kilometers, or £1... This is with the discount. £2.40 for a journey of 300 meters. Should we just we'll put the discount on? Because, you know, if you... Again, getting a rail card is very easy. Unless you're a tourist to the UK, in which case, you know, get screwed. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're under the age of 30, or you're disabled, or you're old, or you're a veteran, or you're job... Se there's, there's, they've got one for every purpose, basically. And so, yeah, long story short, £1.15 to go from Heathrow Terminal 5 all the way to Upminster. Uh, or... You could alternatively pay £1.60, a full 33% more, to go 100 times less distance because of an interesting quirk of this entire system. And so yeah, getting around London's very cheap. Getting into and out of London can be very expensive. And uh, was there a point of this video? Eh, probably not. While you're here anyway though, something I figured I would do is a dip- uh, yeah, So this is my country map. Every now and then someone finds it and they're like, ooh, is this a secret? And it's like, it is not a secret. It's just, it's a fun little thing. It's like a scratch off map, but we do it digitally. And uh, I haven't edited this since I've left the UK. I have a few more American states. And now that they've uh, they've added the individual uh, German, French, and Spanish uh, areas, we could probably update that as well. So we're gonna have to do precisely that right now. Let's go add in, you know, I'm not gonna add, I'm not gonna add the European ones. What I am gonna do though, is I'm gonna add the American and the Mexican states. Let's top up my list, shall we? So Mexico, I've been to Baja California Sur. I've not been to Baja California itself. I've been to Mexico City, is that, oh, it's its own thing. And I've been to whatever Cancun is in. I genuinely don't know the province for Cancun. This is embarrassing. Is it Puebla? No, that sounds, that sounds wrong. Chihuahua, that also sounds wrong. You know, I should know the, the you know, let's find out right now. Where, where did I go that one time I went on the, the most generic uh, you know, British person holiday to Mexico. What state are you in, Cancun? It's in Quintana Roo? Is that correct? I've, I never, I don't know how I never learned that fact, but I, I've been to Quintana Roo, apparently. Should you get to add it to the list if you didn't know you'd been there till you Googled it? Some would say you shouldn't. Anyway, so I'm never gonna go to all of the Mexican states. That's why I don't like these, like, individual, oh no, I don't wanna, uh, no, don't do that. Uh, but what I can now do is we can go to the United States and, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and we can add the new states that I've been to since last time. Wow, did you know that I've been to, uh, I'm pretty sure I, the newest state I went to was Alabama. That was exciting. Uh, had a strong attraction to my co cousin for a few minutes there. Um, is it funny if you say sister? I feel like it's funny if you say, like, you, you gotta go with, like, you know, you, you gotta go with, like, brother. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta pick, like, a really quirky family connection. So even the people in Alabama are like, whoa, that's too far. We do it, we, we do incest here, but we don't do that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just gonna offend everyone with this list. Anyway, and then we've also been to Maine. Gotta tick that one off the list. Uh, I've also been to Kansas. No, I haven't been to Kansas, that's a lie. And uh, I wanna say I ticked up another couple states. I went, I went via New Hampshire, gonna totally take that. And then I'm also gonna, gonna take off uh, Washington. And now my American state map gets very slightly more complete. All very exciting stuff, isn't it? Oh, do I, yeah, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of states left to go. It's very, I, it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a while to get to them all, but it's, it's gonna happen. I've been to Virginia too, actually. I wonder why Virginia's not my thing. You know, what? let's go add Virginia. What, why is Virginia not on there? Can't believe I forgot about you, Virginia. And, uh, yeah, I'm slowly ticking off the American states, one by one, and also apparently not ticking off the Mexican. You know, I could deal with the Australian, I could deal with the Canadian, I could deal with the American. Am I gonna go to every subdivision of China, or India, or Germany? Why Why do these countries have subdivisions, but the world's biggest country doesn't? It's just, you go to Russia or you don't. It's all very confusing. But let me save my map, that you can now view by searching Jetpunk Toycat map, probably. I don't know how you find things on the internet. All I know, uh, that that's why I asked for people to give me climbing advice in London. If you If you happen to be in both this specific city and also climbing and also somehow find this video, hit me up. Or don't hit me up because hitting is impolite. But you know what else is impolite? Leaving the video without smashing that. I'm just kidding. You have, have a good day. Doing whatever it is you do when I'm not here. 
because I'm going to see you all next time. Also, disappointed in how many of you are still becoming patrons. I have explicitly stated time and time again, the patron is there solely for me to funnel money to myself. It's not, we're not improving quality on this channel. Don't worry, every now and then there's a well-edited video people like, oh no. Is Toy Cat using the money to improve the quality? No, the quality is staying rock bottom. Look at this flag. Do you see how it's not even correctly cropped? It's way too blurry. It's not the right resolution in any way. Don't worry, that is the quality I intend to keep up on this channel because I hope you all enjoyed it. And if you want to give me money, you can. If you want to give me love and affection, then you can do that in the comments. And I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye.